You are now locked into the Beyond the Hashtag podcast. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Beyond the Hashtag. Welcome to all of our new listeners and viewers. Welcome to the old ones who've been there since day one as well. Guys, as you can tell by the title, this is our Christmas special. This is our sit-down with Anton Ferdinand. Could you believe a year ago when I started this podcast, I'd be sitting down with Anton Ferdinand, someone who's involved in the most prevalent British football racism incident that, you know, has, has ever been, especially in the last decade or so anyway. Unreal guys, and honestly, what a gent Anton was. Big, big him up for his time and, and for his insights in the episode. If there's one thing I can ask for you guys before the episode kicks off, please, if you're watching on the YouTube, leave us a like. Honestly, it helps with our engagement and it helps grow the platform as, as much as we need it to because we believe that this message is one that needs to go far and wide about solutions to discrimination in football. So hit that like button, leave a comment if you can as well, but please just do what you can to help our engagement. Apart from that, guys, let's kick off the conversation. Sit back, relax, grab something to eat and drink. We won't waste too much time and we'll get into the episode. Enjoy, guys. Welcome back to Beyond the Hashtag. I want to introduce to you a very special guest. Peckham's very own, ex-West Ham, QPR, Sunderland. And for the topic of of our podcast, probably one of the most high-profile racist racist incidents probably this country's ever seen. Um, Yeah, I want to introduce to the listeners Anton Ferdinand. How you doing, man? Thank you for having me. No, I'm good, man. Thanks for coming through. Appreciate it, man. Um, yeah, Anton, we're going to get into a number of topics. Um, it's actually been pretty much a year, almost exactly, since your documentary came out, um, Football Racism and Me, on, on the BBC. So we're going to dive a little bit into that because, as our listeners will know, we did a review of the of the documentary about a year ago. So, you know, some of our thoughts on it. Yeah, a lot of people had a lot to say on it. So I want to get some of your thoughts about the creation of the documentary, the aftermath, that kind of thing. Um and then a bit more about what you're currently doing now, how your thoughts on, you know, the current discrimination in football, you know, seen and, and, and how we can actually progress to solutions um, for all these problems that we're kind of facing. So does that sound good? Yep, man. Yeah. Ah, cool. That's what I'm here for, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, I appreciate you coming through, man. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get it cracking with, with the documentary itself. So, yeah, as I said, Ed... Uh, last November, so November 2020, um, and we're about a year on. So at the time, um, you know, some some of my thoughts, I'll, I'll share them with you, and then I, I'd like to know some of your experiences in creating it. So stuff like you knowing in retrospect that, you know, the system let you down, even though initially you trusted the system. Um, then the whole shadiness of the FA with, like, not releasing, like, some of John Terry's interview, like, interviewing John in a different way that they did to you, like, that whole element left quite a sour taste in the mouth. Um everyone always been so quick to defend JT or defend the accused in a racist incident rather than asking you, the victim, how you are, are you okay, that kind of thing. Um, and then obviously, finally, and we'll touch on this for the future element, your olive branch that you handed out to JT and that sort of not being accepted and all the drama that's sort of, that sort of happened since. Um, but yeah, the floor is yours to let us know about, we can start off with the creation of the documentary and, and your feelings towards that. Yeah, so the creation of the documentary happened... Must be nearly three years ago now. Mm. Um, or the start, the first conversation was about three years ago. Uh, just as I was retiring. Um, and we actually started filming before COVID, COVID yeah. and before uh, Black Lives Matter mm. and before the uh, George Floyd uh, incident. Um, but I was clear in my mind how... I wanted it made, um, which I have to be honest, the BBC were brilliant. At first they didn't get it. Mm. They got it, but they didn't. Yeah. Um, and I said, and I was very clear from the start, if you want to make it an Anton versus John Terry documentary, it I'm not, it's not for me. Yeah. But if you want me to shed light on what happened, yeah, I know I'm going to have to talk about it because... That's the reason why you want me to do the documentary. It's because of the incident, you know. But if you want it to be a, a, um, a he say, she say type thing, mm. I ain't doing it because I, I want to do something that will create positive change. Um, but also tell my truth, mm. you know. And 
that's what it was about. But I also wanted it to be a multicultural documentary. I've watched a lot of racism, sport racism documentaries and a lot of them over the years have just been ethnic minorities talking about racism, you know, and it's funny that after the, after the, not like, so we was obviously filming documentary before uh, Black Lives Matter started and that was my thought process and then all of a sudden the Black Lives Matter demonstrations starts getting bigger, started getting, started to come bigger, but become bigger over here and all of a sudden the, the marches were multicultural, mm. which I was very happy about yeah. because that was my thoughts on yeah, my yeah. thought process before that even happened. Yeah. And the reason why I wanted a multicultural document documentary is because I believe it's not just our fight. Mm. Yeah, it's it's everybody's yeah. fight. It's equality, so that's everyone. Exactly, it's everybody's fight. But the reason why it needs to be everyone's fight is because the oppressor will never oppress their own. You know, and they can't oppress their own because yeah. if they do, they're like, going to be doing the one thing that they don't want is letting the minorities in. Win. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. because if they if they oppress their own and they hold them back, mm. then it gives us it's room gives to us go space. and move and, yeah, and, and yeah. To, to get into positions that they don't really want us in. Yeah. So we'll never oppress our own. But what I think the demonstrations and it being multicultural what it has done is made people open their minds we're nowhere near where we want to no. be but it's made people open their minds to a point where okay i i will never i'll never know the feeling but i can try and to understand yeah. through talking to you about it mm. you know and i think that's the biggest thing that i've taken from especially from from a lot of my friends who work in office jobs, all of a sudden their bosses are asking them yeah. about their journey. Yeah, I can testify, yeah. You know, so. I, I have one friend who spoke about how he feels like he has to put a cloak on yeah, yeah. when he leaves his front door. Yeah, you've got code switch, yeah, yeah, you yeah know? all the time. Yeah. And, and, and se senior members of his team and in his um, job bought into it to what he was saying and, and, and had asked questions, have I been like that? Mm. You know, so the fact that they're seeing people that look like themselves speaking about racism and discrimination the same way we do as ethnic minorities who experience it on a day-to-day -day basis at, at some people, it's making the oppressor stand up and go, do you know what? There's people that look like me that's, talk, that's champion this, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I actually need to listen. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's, that was... Before the Black Lives Matter started, that was your thought. That process. was my thought process yeah. that I want to be different to another, every other documentary. I want white people speaking about an uncomfortable topic, yeah. which it is for them. Mm. You know, not just that. My mum's white. My yeah. mum was white. Sorry. You know, my dad's black. My mum's. I know both sides of the coin. Mm. You know, I use the I use the terminology all the time. I know I know pie and mash. I know chicken <laughs> rice, and rice and peas. And yeah. peas you know, <laughs> yeah. and I like both. Yeah, you know. It, but my mum is a white woman, along with my father, along with my dad, allowed me to understand and know from a young, very young age. You might be mixed race. I might not be dark skin oh, yeah. as you, but I'm a black man. Yeah. You know, society never going to see me. They're going to look at me. Society look at me yeah, and go, oh, there's that white boy yeah. or there's that mixed race <laughs> nah, boy. They're going to go, there's that black boy. Yeah, yeah. You know, so after seeing all these documentaries, I just felt it needed to be multicultural. And I think there's that saying of broken records then. Mm. They're broken records. But when it's their own talking about it, they're not broken records because yeah, it ain't really been done before. Yeah. So that's why I thought it was important that Jordan Henderson was on yeah. it. I thought it was important that Neil, Neil Warnock, Warnock was on it. Yeah. Uh, Gary Lineker, mm. you know, prominent white mouths yeah. who have a following of people who look like them who listen to them. Mm. Henry Winter, yeah. you know, someone who's respected in his field yeah, as a sports good. writer. Mm. But on the other side, I wanted Darren Lewis in it as yeah. well because he knows. He knows the feeling. Yeah. He's worked hard to get to where he needs to get to in the mirror. Mm. 
but I wanted him to be part of it too. So there's a con, so there's there's a contrast, yeah. you know. But not just that, seeing two people in the same field, different colors speaking about it the same way. Yeah. That's what I wanted to show yeah. people, you know. And that's was my thought process in doing it. And I also said to the BBC, "Do you understand the job that you've got?" Mm. it's a big job you know yeah, this yeah. and they was like what do you mean I said you do know if this isn't done right I may never work in football again wow. they was like what really and I was like yeah I may never work in football again because mm. like, if someone interprets your story if, exactly yeah. and I, they was like how I went well what do you think they've done to my footballing career whilst I was playing yeah. I said and that's when I was in control of something I was in control yeah. of my talent I had a talent yeah, yeah. Some people will say I didn't have a talent, but <laughs> I had nah, a talent. Solid. We're going to get to that one, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and if they can dismiss me, you know, and, and the facts are there. People can say, what are you talking about? The facts are there. Mm. After after the the not guilty verdict, yeah. verdict, I played 13 times in the Premier League after that. And you only how, how old when? I was, what was I, 28? Prime, yeah. <laughs> I was twenty. I think I was twenty. Yeah, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. So I weren't even in my prime yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For a centre right. Yeah, yeah. So, like, just let that sink in. Mm. I played over a hundred games in the Premier League. I've been in relegation battles. I've never been relegated. I know how not to get relegated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? yeah. I'm proud of that stat to be Yeah, fair. no, that's... But, like, clubs that came up to the Premier League didn't want to touch me. Clubs that were in releg relegation battles or just beat their relegation battle didn't want to touch me. Mm. Managers I knew didn't want to touch me. Mm. So if they can do that to me whilst I had a talent, and now, what can they do to me now? Yeah. They can put me in a box and throw me away. Yeah, yeah. So this is what you have on your shoulders. And to be fair to the BBC, I, I can't can't fault them mm. you know the the they were understanding they knew the job in hand and they backed me all the way and let me do it the way that I wanted it done and I had a fantastic team around me uh, my agency New York Global Sports Management and New Era, New Era Ingenious Plug that. Come on. Um, <laughs> they they were fantastic the support system was 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 great but also the the director and producers um James and Sean, they were fantastic. Um, they were able to get the best out of me. Mm. And what I mean by that is, been a footballer for... 15 odd years? Yeah, 15, 15 16, 17 years. Yeah. Been a professional. You're told what to say, when to say it, how to say it mm. in interviews. I had to go from being told to say something to now narrating, narrating yeah, the, my the own story. story. Yeah. Mm. And I found that very, very hard. You know, the very the first the first two months I find it very, very hard. Mm. But James and Sean managed to get it out of me, man. And, and I'm forever grateful for them for that, you know. Um and <laughs> sorry and that that was really the, the the journey you know i i never i never went into it thinking it was going to be therapeutic mm, but that's how it turned out but it turned out to be you know and all no like seriously if they would have come to me four five years earlier you wouldn't have done i would have said no i was still angry well, after my mum died, I softened. Yeah. I softened a lot. And you'd think I'd go the other way because... That the anger. And the the anger, anger. And not just that, my mum's first battle with cancer was around the During time During the trial, yeah, yeah. The trial. Yeah. You know? Uh, and I believe it played a part because mm. of the stress of it. Yeah. Um, but it softened me. Mm. And it made me more like my mum. In terms of help, trying to help people, help people yeah, it's powerful. Man. So now I'm going to the documentary. I've got the the, the pressure of carrying my mum's legacy, 
but also telling my truth and and having to use certain terminologies because he got found not guilty yeah, in yeah. the court of law, but wanting to to go hard in some instances, yeah. um, which I was able to do. Yeah, yeah. But just had to be mindful to t- of the terminology I was using. Yeah, because legal and stuff, yeah. You know, and it became a therapeutic po- process that my mum was with me, man, the whole way. Amen. And... How I know that, and I, there's a there's a um, a bit where a scene where I'm I'm back on my estate in yeah, Peckham like, like with Rio and your dad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was doing some cutaway shots on the back grass. The back grass is is um, a bit of grass that goes that's in between two blocks. It's my block. Of, sorry, that's all right. That's in <laughs> that's in the, uh, in between my block of flats and another block of flats. Mm. On the Friary estate, and it was our Wembley, like, and when it was time to come in for dinner, my mum would open the back window and shout, Shut Rio, yeah, Anton, yeah. dinner. <laughs> and anywhere on the estate, it would echo and yeah, it would come yeah. to wherever he was. <laughs> and it was windy that day, and I was doing cutaway shots, so I weren't talking, they were just filming me, and yeah. I was looking into the thingy, and it was windy. And now on the back grass, there's a lot of trees. Seeing the rustle of the trees, I could hear my mum shouting. Wow. It was mad. I could, I could hear her voice as clear as day. Yeah, as clear as like twenty. Yeah, it was years mad, ago, yeah. and I kept tearing up, man. It was mad. Then my last day that I'd done the sh- my last shot shooting day was with West Ham under twenty threes at Chapel oh, yeah, Heath. That, yeah, yeah. And I finished, and I was doing my final thoughts, and I was sitting on one of the buggies doing my final thoughts, and I finished. And I just, I didn't even hear him say cut. I just, <laughs> I was done. And I just got up and started walking. I walked the length of the pitch, just looking at this guy like, just saying, mum, we've done it. Mm. We've done it. And I was just like crying my eyes out, man. Because she was there. Every time I filmed, Definitely, yeah. she was there, man. And, and like, it was a powerful, powerful thing. Like, And the fact that my mum was present, I knew I was doing the right, doing the right thing. thing, yeah. So let me go back to to the reasons why in parts of the documentary are very poignant for yeah, me and yeah, very, right. very important. Jordan Henderson. Yeah. And that that's one of the things I took from it. Like saying, a white person. Him saying Yeah. We was wrong. wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know? Neil Warnock mm. in his sixties. Yeah. As in his sixties, a white man in his sixties saying, I've said things that I'm not proud of. But would I ever say them again? No, I wouldn't. That's powerful. Yeah. For someone of his me. generation as well, because they're the yeah. ones who we claim are never going to change. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Henry Winter, calling the FA mouse style and power. Yeah. It's mad. Like, it's it's unheard of. I've never seen a documentary like it, yeah. talking about racism, where people are willing to, to open up like that. I've never heard a white like person that. say that, let alone it's, Henry it's, Winter. It's, yeah. You know, and... and I think them prominent moments yeah. made the documentary what it was, mm. you know, along with my truth yeah. coming out. Um, but one thing that I was, when the documentary was airing, I didn't care about what other races had to say about me yeah. or about the documentary. I was concerned about my, my, our, yeah, Black people. community yeah yeah you know and the reason why I was concerned the reason why I was a bit apprehensive was because I was doing something that we're not known for doing yeah which was showing empathy to somebody who abused us yeah yeah you know normally it's like why are you doing that for why you, you, yeah, you care about them why like, do you care about yeah, exactly why yeah. you care about why are you abusing them but let's get one thing straight my empathy wasn't one of acceptance mm. My empathy was one of, I don't accept what you're saying, but I'm willing to listen to you. Mm. You know, and I think that for me is, that was my empathy. Yeah. But that also takes back my power, that gives me back the power. Back to you, yeah. You know, within myself. Mm. It gives me back my voice. 
And that's what they said. I wanted my voice back. Uh, my voice had been gone. Yeah, and you didn't say anything for all those years. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. My voice, and, and for people that know me, especially my friends I yeah. grew up with, they couldn't understand. Anton not having a voice. <laughs> why, I was, why I was quiet. Yeah, yeah. We had talks. Why are you being quiet? But I couldn't, I couldn't speak mm. because of the, of the court case. Yeah. But also, I felt like I couldn't speak because I had no, no help. I had no backing. Mm. I was on my own. Like when you look at, in the documentary, I'm going through paper clip, uh, cutouts and cl- yeah, the- clippings. Lord Usley, who was the chairman of Kick It Out at the time, he knew I couldn't speak out, but he coming out, trying to draw me out by saying, if Anton don't speak out, then, then he's letting down every yeah. black player that went before him. Like, it's a liberty. Yeah. That's a liberty. Yeah. But when me and my family ask, Kick it out to wear kick it out t shirts at the court the case. Of the trial, yeah, yeah. They said they you can't do it. do it. My mum asked them as well. My mum asked, like, why are you, we want to see that at the court case. We can't do it. Like, my mum was like, why? Because it will show favoritism towards Anton. My mum was like, but you're actually, John Terry saying he never said it hmm. in that context. So, we're actually backing him then as well because yeah. he's against racism too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We should all be going for the same goal, yeah. But the narrative would have been... You're backing Anton. You're backing Anton because he's kicked racism out of football mm. and I'm black, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that's how it was. And, and say, the, the documentary's made this out there and it's only really now I'm seeing what the documentary's done, mm. you know, because I'm around people more now. I get all age groups coming up to me and talking to me about the documentary. And that's because of the the different demographics that we're trying to reach, yeah, because you made it multicultural, like you said. You know, and and for me it shows that the way that I went about it and my vision for me was the right way. You know, and and, and, and so I, I sit here comfortable. I sit here happy that I've made it. Mm. Proud. Proud. Mm. And most importantly, I sit here knowing that my mum proud of me for doing it. Mm. And the way that I the way that I've done it more than anything. Yeah. That's the thing that I'm most proud of. Not just my mum, my whole family, my yeah. dad, my siblings, my wife, my children, mm. my sons. Like Yeah. He I, asked me. He asked me so many questions. Yeah, I listened to a pod that you were on that you had a conversation with your son about the Chelsea fan hating you, and then like you're about to go on holiday, and then you're in a line with the Chelsea fan, and then he's like, "Oh, like I watch your documentary and like well, fantastic." You know, yeah, and he said to my son, "You're lucky to have a dad like that." Yeah. But I've just spent twenty minutes the night before saying that Chelsea fans hate me and yeah. explaining why Chelsea fans hate me, yeah. and then he's going, "But he's a Chelsea fan. He likes you, Dad." There you go. You know, but I believe that's because he heard Neil Warnock say, "Yeah, he said things." Because that man's probably said things that he shouldn't say. Yeah. But then Neil Warnock's basically saying, "As long as you educate yourself and understand that you can't say them things, mm. okay, cool." Um, mm. Nah, man. Nah, that's nah, that's powerful. And and going back to the impact on on the black community as well. Like, so I, I watched the documentary twice, like when the week it came out. Once for like the emotion, just to like hear your story because. I'm, I was familiar with the story, the case, everything growing up during football. Um, but then the second time to analyze it and, and review it on the pod. And like the first time, almost, I nearly watched it three times just because the first time I was like, it hit me so hard. I was like, wow, like I might even need to watch this again just so I can understand everything that was in it. But yeah, it was, it was like, we need to figure out the impacts on, on the black community. Um, and I've had conversations on, on previous episodes with, with guests who have said, it's not about like the goal of, achieving reverse racism where like if, if black people make it to positions of power we flip it and then we're um um what's the word oppressing white people and other races because that that's not what we claim to want to achieve we, we want to achieve equality and the essence of the word equality is to be equal and to have equal opportunities and those mm-hmm. kind of things so i think there's a level of of sacrifice and and like boldness that has to come from you know ethnic minorities when they're aspiring for change and those kind of things it's not like you have to, you have to kind of question your motives for doing that because it, are your motives to create equality at the end of the day or is it for the hatred to come out and essentially flip what's been going on for all these generations? So. Yeah, I mean, for me, the fact that 
I'm showing empathy to somebody who allegedly um, said what was said. Allegedly. Um, there's no motive for me. Yeah. The only motive is positive change. You know, and I think like when we talk about work and getting into positions of power, I only want I want to be there because I'm good at what I do, not yeah. because of the colour of my skin. Black, yeah. I think that's all wrong for me. Yeah. That's box ticking. Yeah. And we're and we're seeing a lot of that now. Yeah. And I think that's our next fight mm. is to undo all the box ticking. Because there's people that say, for instance, we used one of people on TV. Um, I've done the un- unapologetic um, show yeah. yesterday. And that show would never have been aired two years prior. Yeah. No chance. No. But what I like about it and why I wanted to do it is because there's two strong black women mm-hmm. in Yinka and ZZ who are true to themselves. Yeah. They're the right people to be in front of the camera because if their producers yeah. tell them not to say something, they tell them to shut up. <laughs> this is yeah. important. Yeah. You know, and 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 they're the right people, but right now I think there's too many that ain't the right people because yeah. they get in a place of power and they go silent. Yeah, forget themselves, forget the community. You know, yeah. and, and, and I think that's what we're seeing a lot of at the moment. Mm. Oh, you've asked for more people on TV? Okay, we'll give you more people yeah. on TV. Like these tokenism. people, these, exactly, they're probably conditioned. Yeah, facts. Before they even, they've already been vetted mm. before they go on. Yeah, yeah he, he won't be controversial. Mm. Go on, he'll go. Yeah. You and know? He, he ticks the box, yeah, he's one of them, like, it's fine, they'll shut up, like, they exactly. see him yeah, Exactly, it's, it's you know, and I'm not one for, I'm one for, if you're, it doesn't matter what colour you are, if you're good at your job and you deserve that position, you get that position, that's what equality yeah. is, right? Yeah, literally. You know, so that's the way that I see things. Mm. Um, <coughs> sorry, that's the way that I see things, and that's the way I want things to be. To be, and that was my that was my feelings behind positive change. Yeah, positive change for everybody. Yeah, right. you know, and 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 that's what I'm about, yeah. and and that's what I champion for. More than anything. No, nah, facts, bro. And yeah, and, and you know, going more onto like the aftermath of the documentary and, and some of the effects afterwards. So even, for example, I don't know if you've seen, do you know Jamie Johnson, the CBBC, um, it's like a TV show for like f- uh, kids who are footballers, but they did one, it's like a, they've done like five or six series, but they did one episode um, aired recently, which Troy Townsend sort of put my way, which was, it was about a player who got racially abused on the pitch. Like literally we're talking like, under nines, under tens, whatever, got racially abused on the pitch, and then the whole team, um, like, kind of took the took the plays off the pitch, and they had like a whole like palaver about whether it was right, whether it was wrong, that kind of thing. But it was essentially like, you know, this is twenty twenty one, and there's a show like kind of a drama for kids, kind of showing what you went through back in the day. But I don't think that kind of thing would have ever happened if something like your documentary wouldn't have even come out and that kind of impact. So I think it's. Do you know what? I've never ever seen it like that. Someone said it to me the other day and I find it hard to to take it and I find it hard to receive because I've never done it for... For that. For them accolades. I've never done it for any accolades or any awards that I've won. I've never ever done it for that. Um, like someone said it to me the other day, you, you know because of what you went through is why people are able to speak now. And I'm like, I find it hard to take that in. Yeah. I find it hard to to process that, mm. you know. Um, it's it, it's just something that don't that I struggle. It don't enter my head. Yeah, yeah. You that, know, I can't. That I, I you're can't that explain guy. It. That, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. That, that, I can't explain it. It's like. I wish I wasn't that guy, yeah. <laughs> but if it's made that impact for now people to have a voice or now people to see, learn from my experience of what happened and deal with it in the right way and feel supported unlike I did, 
then then I'm comfortable being that person. So that brings us to the end of part one. Leave a comment with your thoughts on the episode. What do you think about the documentary? What's been your biggest takeaway from the Anton conversation so far? Um, and stay tuned. So stay subscribed for part two, where we're going to be talking about taking the knee, the lack of action from social media companies, and some listeners' questions sent in by you guys. So yeah, make sure you're subscribed and hit the notification bell so you get the drop of when we release part two. But trust me, it, it, it's, it's a good one. And we're going to have a, a bit of funny conversation with Anton as well. So if you like this content, send it to a friend and we'll see you guys in part two.